Jeremy, and our chairman, Siva, is here this evening. So thank you, Siva, for inviting me to make this talk. As Jeremy said, the talk this evening is about the German Enigma cipher machine, <laughs> the Turing British bomb, and the bomb rebuild project. So I will try and highlight, well, I will highlight the key dates and players and cover the basic principles of the machines. I will end the presentation with a few newsreel <coughs> video clips taken at Bletcher Park, and there should be time at the end for a few questions, and if we run out time, time for time in the foyer after the talk. <coughs> now, Bletcher Park has undergone much development in recent years, and I can't help giving it a plug uh, at, at this moment. It's the home of the only authentic working Turing bomb. The Polish story, the Enigma trail, the only authentic working Colossus, rebuilt by the late Tony Sale, and originally used to break the German High Command Lorenz code. A growing exhibit of historical computers and artifacts, a research archive, an educational centre, an international conference centre, and much more. So well, I know some of you will have visited there, and some of you have visited many times. If you haven't, you've got a treat in store. There's now a great deal of information in books and on the web. And some of you may have been visited that actually, seen the bomb working, and heard Frank Carter's talks there. <clears throat> you may also be aware that this year is the centenary of Turin's birth, a very special year, and has been celebrated with talks, exhibitions, and events throughout the UK. Some of you may have listened to James Grimes' lecture on the same subject last Wednesday, but hopefully you'll find my talk technically a little more enlightening. <laughs> we have a lot to cover, so I must move fast and follow my script closely. I'm not one of the uh, professors or, or doctors of, in the university uh, field where they will walk all around waving their hands and talking uh, without breaking. I can't afford to miss anything, really. What I might miss might be crucial for the talk. Now, the story of the British bomb... <clears throat> let's start using this. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Got it. Right. The story of the British bomb starts here at Bletchley Park in 1938 with Captain Ridley's shooting party. It was a cover for a small group of people from the Government Code and Cipher School, the precursor to GCHQ, now at Cheltenham, and a part of what is now MI6. They were looking for a new base outside London. And Bletchley Park was ideal. It was buried in the box countryside with good roads for those days and nearby rail and good telephone and teleprinter connections. <clears throat> now, an interesting thing, well, although I, I didn't, wasn't going to mention this, but I will, in 1938-39, some of you may have heard him, the eminent, the eminent cryptanalyst Dilly Cox, or Dillwyn Cox, he was the one of the first to be installed at Bletchley Park. He had worked with the intelligence services since World War I and was the first at Bletchley to break an Enigma message. But the process was difficult and too slow in a fast-moving military conflict. <clears throat> this is a view of the rebuilt <coughs> bomb at Bletchley Park. It is modelled on machine number 297, which was named at that time Atlanta and was delivered to the American Bay at East Coast in July 1944. <coughs> it was seven foot long, six and a half foot high, and two foot deep, and weighed well over a ton. Approximately two, by the way, is the, the mark, is it, is, is, it, um, is it okay, is it clear for you? Okay. <clears throat> Approximately 220 British bombs were produced during World War II. And what is remarkable is that from Turing's initial sketchy outline, through development, first production, but the first prototype, 
and delivery of the first four production machines took only eight months. Could you imagine that thing today? Eight months. Most were designed, uh, <coughs> most were destroyed at the end of World War II, but 50 were retained for a while to work on Russian and other Enigma code. You might ask why they actually kept them. Well, the reason for it is, at the end of, towards the end of the war, the British forces collected all the Enigmas they could find, all of them, and they put them all back to the UK, and then they resold them to Russia and various other places. <laughs> but they didn't tell them they could break them. <laughs> the British and Americans cooperated and exchanged technical information uh, <clears throat> during World War II, particularly from 1942, and the Americans built a number of their own versions. Now, Bletchley and its outstation used various versions and specials of this machine. But my talk is about the most widely used three drum or 39 point version. 39 points, because if you could imagine A to Z around the drums, that's 26. And it did one and a half revolutions, uh, first 26 to, to actually test every position, and another 13 to actually reset and, and, and step the drums <coughs> to the next one in, in, in sequence. Right. Now, I became involved with Enigma and the Turing Bomb when I joined the Rebuild Project in September 2000. I was trained, on, as Jeremy said, on the, in the RAF for Air Radar, and from there joined the British Tabulating Machine Company, or BTN, and in 1956 as a computer support engineer. The company eventually evolved into ICT, then ICL, and is now part of Fujitsu, and that's where my pension comes from. <laughs> for, for any historical computer boss here tonight, the first machine that I worked on was called the BTM HEC or Horus Electronic Computer, later renamed the ICT 1200. This series was the first small commercial digital computer. The prototype was first switched on in November 1951 and was demonstrated at the Business Efficiency Exhibition in 1953. And 125 were delivered in the 1950s, more than all other contemporary British computers put together. But that's another story. Now, I knew nothing about the company's World War II work on British bombs until the early 1990s, even though some of my colleagues had worked on bomb production and maintenance. I even worked for several weeks in 1958 on a customer problem down at Morgan Crucibles, I don't think they're there anymore, uh, with Harold Doc Keane, who was very friendly and knowledgeable of BTM and a great help to me on that project. But not a word about the bomb, but more about Doc later. I attended a pensioner reunion and talk about the bomb, the uh, bomb rebuild uh, project by John Harper. He was three years into the project and looking for more volunteers. I was hooked and I agreed to tackle some relay coils. <clears throat> of course, it turned out to be more than just a few and my involvement was to last over seven years. And I must say John Harper's a great project leader. He's a, a good and a, he can twist one's arm uh, without you even feeling it. You don't know what he's doing. Considering the complexity of the bomb, yeah, let's move on. <coughs> go. Why did he go? Yes, sir. What should I be pointing this out, Chris? This thing. It's not going. Ah, I'll put it down there. Right. Considering the complexity of the bomb, is surprisingly reliable, and which John Harper uh, put down to each volunteer incorporating his own rigorous quality checks. For reliability and authenticity, I would agreed to make all the coils from scratch, and I built the relays themselves, all to either exactly as they would have been at the time. I agreed to make the coils, as I say, all 268 plus 30 complete reworks and 111 non-inductive resistors. 
I did this with the help of this 1932 Douglas Wander machine at the back of my garage. 1932. It was built in their Whitechapel factory, which is long gone. Now this shows how, it will do, how tolerant <laughs> and helpful my wife was as I worked one, <clears throat> one year on the corner of the kitchen top as she pre prepared Christmas lunch lunch. <laughs> right. This view of the bomb shows many of the cars that I made. On the right panel there, you can see the hollowed type relays with the actual coil, the coils that I now rewound. Down here are the are the high speed <coughs> high speed Siemens type relays, and down there, which is just about visible, are the non-inductive resistors. Also, at the back of the, uh, the, the panels, the scrambler panels, which you'll see the bombs, you'll see the drums in a, on a later one, at the back, about there and there, are two a relay operated latches for moving, moving, uh, uh, advancing the drums. Now, <clears throat> now the research, the acquisition of dr and redrawing of documents which we got from Bletchley Park, GCHQ Cheltenham, and some of them from the USA archives, the frame, the panels, the components, the subunit production, final assembly, which was at Bletchley, commissioning, testing, debugging, and project documentation took about 12 years under the wing of the BCS Computer Conservation Society, part of the BCS Computer, uh, computer uh, Society. It involved over 60 volunteers, <clears throat> plus a few sponsor companies. We were particularly fortunate in that we were supported by STC NTL, who were oh, virtually uh, about to, they were winding down in Harlow at that time, but we had free use of long corridors where we could, <clears throat> where we could assemble the 12 miles or so of cables and wiring looms, and they provided workshops and a storage space in the basement. Very helpful to us. Final bomb assembly was at Bunchy Park, now it cost about sixty-five thousand pounds. Oh, that's very good. But remember, mostly volunteer voluntary work. However, we think it would have cost about a million pounds if we had <coughs> subcontracted the the job to a commercial company. But that's assuming that we could find a commercial company to do it. Also, we would have got and built up the project knowledge and the close working ties that we have with Bletchley Park and with the guides. And the guides appropriately named this machine Phoenix. Although the project was deemed complete after 12 years, guide and operator training continues, and the bomb, as some of you may have seen, is demonstrated most weekends. So how did the bomb come about? Well, we must start with the enigma and what it was, and how it came about. Now, cipher, in some form or other, has been used to hide the true meaning of a message or command for at least two and a half thousand years. One of the earliest documented examples is of Polybius, an ancient Greek, and that was in the 6th century BC. In 1943, 1843, sorry, Samuel Finley Brees Morse devised the Morse code for the American Telegraph, adopted later as the International Morse Code. And the telegraph was adopted worldwide and still used long after World War II. And in 1901, Marconi demonstrated the use of radio to transmit and receive Morse signals. By World War I, Radio telegraphy, uh, oops. Okay. Good. <clears throat> within 
a three-year period from 1917 to 1919, four inventors in different countries came up with the idea of using a rotor or code wheel to scramble letters in a message. But here we will concentrate on Arthur Scherbius. Now Arthur Scherbius was a German electrical engineer and he developed an interest in encryption during World War I and further developed his ideas and incorporated some ideas from the Dutch design. In 1918, he applied for a paint for a portable battery-operated cipher machine. He informed the German Navy and the Foreign Office, but they rejected his proposals at that time. Also about this time, Scherbius collaborated with another engineer, Richard Ritter, and they set up a company, Scherbius and Ritter, and inventing and marketing many devices of a technical nature and continue to develop the cipher machine. Now in 1923, <clears throat> they published and tried to market an early commercial version, <coughs> the first Enigma. It was aimed at the German, <clears throat> German post office, banks, commercial companies, and the International Postal Union. Although it aroused great interest and had some successful trials, it was not a commercial success. However, in 1926, the German Navy changed its mind and trialled and adopted the commercial enigma, followed in 1928 by the German Army. Then in 1930, secret talks took place with Scherbius and Ritter, and the military version was developed with new rotors, <clears throat> a new reflector, a stacker or plug board, we'll talk about those in a moment, and in 1933, the Luftwaffe and civil agencies adopted it. Unfortunately, Scherbius, he was to die in May 1929, so he didn't see the full adoption of his machine. This shows a military enigma. It looks very similar to the original commercial version, and the basic concept remained throughout its life. It has 26 key, a 26 letter keyboard, a 26 letter lamp output lamp panel. This one has three rotors. Underneath there is the reflector, and at the front, is the stacker board, A to Z, two letters, two letters for each, two, two, two sockets for each letter. Nothing in, in, in <clears throat> nothing in, in a, pair of, a pair of sockets means that the, the letter is unchanged. But a pair of wires from one socket, say A to B, meant that B, A would change to B, and B would go change to, B, uh, to A in either direction. Now you have to remember that there's, there is uh, the, 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 uh, <coughs> you have to remember that there is only one stacker board. So that the, the color that goes, see, goes through the stacker board, through the rotors, returns from the rotor, and comes back through the stacker board again. So the stacker actually changes the letters in either direction. <clears throat> now for interest, whoops, whoops. For interest, this shows the British equivalent called the Type X. It looked very similar. It had a keyboard, a pluggable stacker, a reflector, and rotors. But it used five rotors chosen from ten. And the wiring core of each rotor could be removed and go in either way. So the effective wheel choice was five from twenty. The left hand three wheels that is those, the left and three wheels, they 
voice that in enigma fashion, but could be wired to emulate a German service enigma. <clears throat> the two right-hand wheels are settable, but do not step. Also, unlike enigma, the rotor positions, A to Z, were not sequential. Those. They're not actually sequential. <clears throat> and each rotor had multiple steps. So with these and other design features strict and strict operating procedures, Type-X code was never broken. <clears throat> this shows the version of Type-X used at, Ta at Bletchley Park, which is wired to emulate an enigma. It had paper tape one that side and one that side. There's paper tape printers to record the input enciphered and the output deciphered texts. Now in 1935, Germany denounced the Versailles Treaty, started to seriously build up her military forces and set the scene for World War II. By the summer of 1938, there were 20,000 enigmas in use. Now, up to the 15th of September 1938, enigma operators used the same message rotor settings. These are the settings, that's the settings for the, for the three wheels. They would set the three wheels to X, Y, Z, or whatever. <clears throat> but at that, up to that time, they used the same rotor message setting or indicators for the duration of the Enigma settings, or keys, at first three monthly, then monthly, and finally daily. However, from that date, they used a new random setting for each message, or part message. And in December, two more rotors were introduced, so the choice was now <laughs> three and five. Now, these two changes introduced serious difficulty for the Polish cryptanalysts but more about them later. And by the summer of 1939, there were 40,000 enigmas in use, and in September, Germany invaded Poland. Hmm. Now this shows the internal wiring of an enigma rotor. Note the letter ring. <coughs> On some rotors, numbers 1 to 26 were used. The ring could be unclipped and rotated to set the trip position for the next rotor. <clears throat> now this is a box set of five rotors, and on the right hand side of each rotor are 26 sprung connector pins, each side. Whoops, there, see? There. On the left hand side is our 26 connector pads. And this shows the three selected rotors mounted on a rod being inserted into the machine. And when in place, a lever on the right hand side pushes the input output connector pads onto the right hand rotor pins, pushes the whole lot to the left onto the reflector connector pins and each wheel is held in position <coughs> by a sprung rod but can be rotated by hand and wheel one on the right hand side the wheel one is advanced one position each time a keyboard letter is depressed <coughs> now this illustrates an enigma key depression at the top right, pressing keyboard letter A, that's a whoops, Daisy, that's there, it disconnects the lamp panel A, it moves rotor one one place, and it connects the battery to the stacker letter, input letter A, which is there, in there. <coughs> a goes to B the stacker, then to N, then to J, then to R, through the reflector, then to E, then to H, and then to A, 
and then to L, and finally back to light lamp P. If keyboard letter is pressed again, the keyboard letter A is pressed again, row to 1 would move one more place, and possibly row to 2, and a different lamp would be illuminated. Now, the cycle permutations for each character are, first of all, rotor choice, 3 out of 5, or 60. The rotor position, that's 26 cubed, or 17 and a half thousand. And the total for wheels only is over a million. But the total permutations with the stacker board is 154 million, million, million. A daunting code problem to solve, and the Germans thought it was unbreakable. <clears throat> now this shows the command vehicle of General Guderian, a senior panzer <coughs> division commander, probably taken near the front line. Now typically there would have been one RT and two Enigma operators on shift round the clock. A special signals corps trained all Enigma and RT personnel and supplied them with their equipment to each command unit. An entire signals battalion was deployed with each Panzer unit. No matter how fast a battle progressed, command units were in contact with each other with support and service units and with HQ. It should be noted here just how labor intensive and expensive was the Enigma system. It's one of the reasons, but only one of the reasons, there were technical ones as well, why the German High Command later adopted the Lorenz system. Now, Enigma daily keys, <coughs> our settings, were issued to each command unit <coughs> by Signals Core HQ. And this shows a typical monthly sheet of daily keys. Now we need to differentiate here between the Enigma keys, which were changed every day at midnight, and the message rotor indicators or settings set by the Enigma operator for each message or part message, which were usually limited to about 250 characters. <coughs> Different Enigma keys were issued for each type of traffic on each network. And not all command units would have sheets for all traffic. For example, Confidential HQ or SS traffic could only be read by authorised units supplied with the appropriate sheet of daily keys. So starting on the left, we have the day of the month. We've got the choice and order of the three rotors. We have the ring setting or trip position for each rotor. We have 10 staggered pairs, leaving six letters unstaggered or unchanged. And finally, four traffic codes. And you know, they change every day. Four traffic codes are discriminants for that traffic on that network which the Enigma operator rotated for successive messages. So to recap, the Enigma keys for each type of traffic... Oh, what's that saying to me? Don't restart. <laughs> Everybody is it. <laughs> Thank you. So to recap, the Enigma keys for each type of traffic for each unit in a network were issued monthly for each day, effective from midnight. So you can imagine, if you didn't have a bomb to do it, and you was trying to break these things, by the time you'd broken one, it could be days and days on, and there's all this, <coughs> all this traffic coming in all the time, every day. And to complicate you know, the operation further, the originating Enigma operator chose, supposedly at random, and he didn't always do it that way, he sometimes took shortcuts, especially when the war got really, uh, really underway, <clears throat> he chose 
the initial and message rotor settings for each message or part message. Now to make this clearer, this is a typical Enigma intercept <clears throat> up to May 1940, sent to Blackshear Park by the Y monitoring stations. Now usually it took a few minutes for the German controlling unit <clears throat> to set up the network and ensure that no more than one unit transmitted on the same frequency at the same time. Now during this time, a Y station operative would identify the network, note the frequency, and another operative with RDF would note the bearing. Now more than one Y station could usually intercept a signal, and bearings from two or more Y stations enable Bletchley Park to track the movement and location of command units. Now, <clears throat> the top piece, this is, what, this is what the Y station added to it. This is what, this is the signal that they're picking up uh, from, from, on the German, uh, <coughs> from the, from the uh, German traffic. The first half is in two parts. <clears throat> the first part or preamble is in plain text, plain German text followed by the second and cipher part in groups of five letters. <coughs> the radio caller signs alerted the network and the discriminant identified the type of traffic and the authorized target. So as soon as the discriminant was identified, the target Enigma operator would set up the appropriate daily keys from the sheet that he's got while the RT operator will continue to receive and note the message. The target Enigma operator now set the rotors to the rotor indicator VXP. This is in the, in the preamble, in plain text, VXP. And he would set the three rotors on his Enigma, this is the guy that's receiving it, to VXP. And he would type the first six letters of the inside of text, those first six letters. The lamps would indicate, in this case, RCM, RCM. RCM being the actual message indicator. He would then set the, the rotors of this enigma to RCM, and he would continue typing the rest of the enciphered message, starting at character seven. The lamps would illuminate the original message in plain text, which would be noted by the second Enigma operator. <clears throat> this illustrates some of the weaknesses of the Enigma system, which were capitalized by the code breakers. A letter cannot cipher to itself. Only one step aboard for both input and output. If A goes to H, then H goes to A in both directions. The use of polite, disciplined, stylized messages. Oh, the Germans were so strict and polite and kept to the routines. The use of names and rank. Lazy mistakes, often referred by Bletchley as sillies. A message repetitions and relays using the same text and double encryption of the rotor message indicators, that is, until May 1940. The Germans made a number of changes to the operating procedures and several variants, including a Ford rotor model for the Navy. And throughout World War II, they believed that Enigma was secure. Fortunately, there was one minor operating <coughs> procedure that they did not employ, uh, which would have stopped Bletchley dead in its tracks. The originating operator could have inserted some random letters throughout the message, and these would have been obvious to the receiving unit, but would have made the crib and bomb-based method difficult, if not impossible. Now at this stage, we pause to give credit to the Polish Cipher Bureau. 
<clears throat> this was set up in early 1920s by the new Polish state, which was set up, as you will, many of you will know, after the end of the First World War. In the 1920s and 30s, British intelligence had little interest in German codes and ciphers, believe it or not, until it was almost too late. Concentrating on USA, their friends, Japan and Russia. The Poles and the French, threatened on their borders <coughs> by a resurgence in German military, took a different view. During the 1920s, the Poles concentrated on German codes and ciphers, breaking them with little problem until 1926, when the Germans started to adopt Enigma. Now, to meet this new situation, the Bureau recruited a number of top-class mathematicians and students and put them through a course on cryptanalysis, but only three completed the course successfully and in 1930 were assigned to the German section. They were here, Henrik Zygarski on the left, Josip Rosicki and Marian Rzewski. All from Poznan University, all fluent in German. The Bureau also bought a commercial enigma, and around 1931-32, a French intelligence officer obtained priceless information from spy Hans Theo Schmidt, which included, and he's a German by the way, <coughs> which included details of the military enigma, operating instructions, keys for five months of 1932, and enigma in Seinfeld text and its corresponding plain text. You think, wow! But at this time, the French and British were unable to use the information to break Enigma traffic. <clears throat> However, when it was passed to the Polish intelligence service, Rzewski, when I get in, <coughs> oops, there, the tracker, there we go, <clears throat> Rzewski picture here used complex permutation theory and was able to deduce the internal wiring of the three Enigma rotor wheels and the non-rotating reflector. The Bureau also intercepted an Enigma machine on its way to the German embassy, noted its details before passing it on. Now, <coughs> Ruski, he converted the commercial Enigma to a military one, and he built a number of replicas, and he deduced the internal wiring of the two additional rotors introduced in 1938. His colleague Zygarski devised a method of finding the rotor order and initial message settings using complex hand punch sheets. And once shown here, all made by hand. There was one for each of the six rotor orders and are based on the six-letter message indicator. If you remember, the six-letter indicator, the first six letters of the, of the <laughs> enciphered text in the German messages. These were known as Zygarski sheets, which actually used for a while. The team also built two clever devices, and I can't tell you any more than, the, the, than what the names is, there's a cyclometer, and I know that that actually had six six scramblers in it and he also used the six letter message indicator and the bomb bite, another one and from July 1933 they were able to break up to 75% of Enigma traffic on a daily basis within hours of receipt they were initially aided by the Germans who at first changed the Enigma keys as I said, only three months later but later changed them monthly, and then finally daily. The Germans introduced the two additional rotors in 1938, making it difficult for the Zygarski method because of the tenfold increase in the number of sheets required. By the summer of 1939, Poland was under serious threat. 
and the Poles arranged a historic meeting in July in the Priory Forest with British and French intelligence, at which they handed over replica enigmas, instructions and procedures, examples of enigma messages and decrypts, and full details of their methods and devices. Now, until then, the British and French had been struggling with enigma messages, and they must have been a standard. I originally wrote in their gobsmack, they really would, absolutely. Without this help, Bletchley Park would not have got started so early, and possibly not got the funding that it did. When the fall of Poland became inevitable, the Cypher Bureau was disbanded, and all remaining documents and machines were destroyed. Rzewski, Zygarski and Rosicke first moved to Vichy, France, then via Spain and Gibraltar to England, and they returned to Poland after the war. Now, during their stay in the UK, they worked with the British Intelligence Service, but under the Polish in exile. And sadly, possibly because of their time in, Vit in, in Vichy, France, they were not allowed to visit or work at Bletchley Park. I find that quite sad. Fortunately, Alan Turin was recruited to Bletchley Park in 1939, and in the autumn was shown the treasure from Poland, and treasure it was. He immediately applied his mind to devising a machine-based method independent of the indicators and procedures to help find the rotor message settings and the stacker letter pairs. Note, the machine was not designed to break the code. That was the domain of the code breakers, but it was a great help. Now this is a copy a typical of a typical enigma intercept, but now from May 1940. Remember, we looked up until May, month, it is now from May 1940 onwards, <clears throat> and from this date, the Germans instructed the enigma operators to encipher the message keys only once, showing, with, showing both rotor indicator and enciphered message indicator <coughs> together in the plain, plain text shown here as, there, the XP, WQS. As before, the target enigma operator would set the machine with the keys of the day, then set the rotors to VXP, and type the message indicator WQS. The panel lamps would indicate RCM, the message setting, and the rotors would then be set to RCM, and the enciphered message, the whole of the enciphered message, will be typed to reveal the actual message on the lamp panel. Now, this small change to procedure rendered the Zygalski sheets of no use. Fortunately, the prototype bomb was delivered to Bletchley in the spring, and the first four production machines in May. Now these three men are the key players in the design, development and production of the bomb. <clears throat> when they first met in the autumn of 1939, Turing was about 26 and Welshman about 33 and Keane about 44. Turing and Welshman were brilliant Cambridge mathematicians <clears throat> and Turing had a flair for abstract processes and electromechanical devices also theoretical devices, which he actually kept in his head as he used them. You know, it's amazing, man. <coughs> and was a leading, at that time, was a leading code breaker at Bletchley. Now, Keane was the chief engineer for the British Tabulating Machine Company, or BTM. And he was a large accounting and office machine company, and, ran the design, and he ran the design and development workshops and special laboratories. He was not academically trained, but called Doc because of the battered doctor's bag. I always remember when he came down to Bowen Crucibles, he still carried his doc, doc bag, his doctor's bag, in which he carried his tools. He was sceptical, terribly sceptical about the reliability of valve technology, but there was little he did not know about electromechanics. Now, Turing. And before I say this, I'll say that for some reason, I've read once or twice, actually, 
that, I mean, you're talking about Turin a young 26, and Keane about 44, and yet they clicked, clicked together, and worked extremely well, got on very, very well. And Turin explained his ideas and methodology and sketched it out for Keane. Keane turned this into full production drawings using, wherever possible, standard accounting components. A standard accounting machine components. The early trial machine was delivered to Bletchley amazingly by the spring of 1940. And this early design depended on a closed menu loop from the crib, which was often very weak. And we'll come back in a moment. <clears throat> Turing's method was based on the code breaker, first of all deducing, don't ask me how he does it, amazing, deducing the, the rotor wheel order, deducing a plain text crib to match part of the enciphered message, devising a menu for the bomb designed to find the message rotor settings and some of the stacker letter pairs. Remember the stacker board at the front, which changed the letters? Now, so the idea of the bomb was to find the, road, the initial rotor settings and the stacker letter pairs, which, which ones were going to be changed. Finally, the code breaker deduced the remaining stacker letter pairs and the ring settings to run the enciphered message on a British Type X machine modified to emulate an Enigma. Now the bomb was an essential tool to speed up the code breaking job and could save hours or days or more. The code breaker relied on captured documents and on building up a profile and history of the Enigma operators working on the traffic that the code breakers were working on. And you'll, so you'll soon understand part of the contribution made by Gordon Welshman. Now this illustrates a crib and shows the plain text at the top. We go. Numbers 1 to 25 and the plain text and the enciphered text. We can now thread our way through using the plain text and enciphered message as follows. Starting at 4, here we go. starting at 4, <coughs> U goes to H. At 9, H goes to A, U goes, sorry, at 9, H goes to E. At 16, E goes to Y, and finally, at 22, Y goes back to S. Now you can follow that particular part of the, the menu on this part of the grid. So, I'll go over here. <clears throat> now there were there were two major problems with this. First of all, there was a high probability of a wheel one to two turnover within the twenty-five characters. And also each position, each position there, each of these positions represents an enigma keystroke i.e. a three-wheel scrambler with an input-output sticker board. Now problem one was solved by splitting a long likely crib into 13 characters or less and the, <clears throat> and the menus then run separately or on two bombs. So that one with a trip might fail and the other one might give a good result. Turing quickly realized how he could solve problem two, and more about that in a moment. Now this shows a really weak crib, simple crib, that matches the word general in English.
to the Crit and Cipher text in positions 46 to 52. Now you must remember that each line, each of these lines, each line is actually a bunch of 26 wires. And that each position represents a message keystroke by the Enigma operator. So, we can now thread our way from A at 47 through positions 49, 48, and back to A at 47. Now this will form part of a menu, shown as the closed loop at the bottom. Now you rem remember we are still talking at the moment of menu letters, menu letters, crib letters, or in cipher letters here at the moment. <coughs> This is the same crib, but with the enigma, including the stacker at each position. Now remember, there's only one enigma, shown at different keystroke positions, <coughs> although the stacker is shown at both the top and the bottom of each position. That's there and there. There is only one stacker, and current can flow in either direction. So, I have to get my specs off to like that. So, E to E, that bit there, and N to N is redundant because this, the stackered letter in there, coming out of the scrambler, is the same letter going into that one. So, we can remove them as was shown on the bottom, bottom diagram. Now the three wheel or drum groups at each position, and that is those, each of those, we refer to those as scramblers. This is the basis of the initial bomb design, and it illustrates Turing's ability to think through a problem as he does. Now hopefully, the crib, the, <coughs> the cryptanalyst, <coughs> will have devised a crib and message letters, which are, no, he will certainly know the crib letters, and he'll hope he is matching the correct message letters. But he doesn't know the stack of letters in and out of the scramblers. But Turin realized that he could import any letter, there we're inputting A in here. He could input any letter, say A, at position 47 and attach a test circuit, there, this test circuit, to each of the 26 lines, each of the 26 lines <coughs> at that position. If A is the correct stacker letter for A, when the scramblers are in the correct position, reflecting the positions, the timing of the Enigma keystrokes, if it's in the right position, A, and only A, is returned from position 48 to 47, through there. Whoops, there we go. There we go, see? There, 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 and the A there again. A and only A. If the wrong input letter, say P, was inserted there, position 48 would return a different letter. This would go round and round the circuit until all lines, all letters, all lines, carried a current, except A and only A. So the bomb would still detect an open circuit and would stop and give the right result. <clears throat> As a reminder, this is the same crib again, showing six of the 26 wires from the bomb schematic. 
And at the top right, input power of switch A is made, test relay A is active, all other relays are inactive, and the test indicator, the indicator register, will show down here A and only A. Or if the if if not A was input, if, if, if say P was was switched, if, if switch P was made, you would end up down here with all the all the levers down except one, except A. We're now going to take a quick look at Gordon Welshman, who made many significant early contributions. Now, when he first arrived at Bletchley, knowing little about Enigma, he was asked to look at intercepts entirely on his own. He analysed and tabulated data from the plain text preamble. Not the inside of it, but from the plain text preamble. And he established close working ties with the wire station. He soon set up the reception centre and the card index registry, supported by a large BTM Horace card accounting unit, using bearings, call signs, frequency and discriminants, he was able to colour code the traffic and so route each intercept to the appropriate cryptanalyst team. Walshman then joined Turing very briefly, early in 1940. He was actually on his way to one of the huts as a senior as a senior cryptanalyst. I don't know which one, he might have been on the Navy one. <clears throat> but for a brief while, he joined Turing just to find out what Turing was doing. And he looked at some of Turing's examples, example menus, and early sketches, and he quickly realised that the attributes of the sticker board could be utilised to cross-connect the crib and allow much larger, stronger menus with open ends. He realised that if a crib or message letter A was stickered to C, then C was stickered to A in either direction. And it could cross it could cross it could utilise this by cross wiring the bond making it possible to include in menus what were previously dead ends. He arranged this on a wire and he, <coughs> he arranged this as a wiring panel. No, just a it looked complicated, but it's actually ingeniously simple. The 26 wire cables and jacks connect a crib menu letter or junction to the diagonal board. So, for example, a current on crib letter A sent by C, follow that through. There we go. There's, there's crib letter A, and it's and there's a light and, and there's a current on stacker stacker <coughs> stacker letter C, <coughs> and that on the on the diagonal board was cross-connected to menu C, stacker vine A. Okay. Stacker, that's A, stacker C, to C, stacker A. <coughs> it's ingenious. It created much stronger menus and was built into the bomb simply by this wiring panel. And it's called the Diagonal Board. Two production machines to Turing's original design were delivered by early summer 1940, shortly followed by two more of Welshman's design, which became the basic pattern for all future machines. So really, I think, the machine could be called the Turing Keen Welshman Bomb, really. But of course, the original design was Turing's. Now, amazingly, these machines were designed, produced, and delivered all within eight months, as I said, <clears throat> just in time for the Battle of Britain and the Battle of the Atlantic. Now, <coughs> we're now 
going to look at a more a real and more realistic crypt from a lady called Peggy Erskine Tullock, a cryptanalyst who worked at Blessed Park during World War II. Some of you may have seen this crypt on the wall <coughs> near the Turing bomb at Blessed Park. I hope to enlighten you a little bit about what it means. Now it's part of a weather forecast and the crib covers relative key positions 1 to 16. The menu uses 13 positions marked with a Y. Now only relative positions are used. The cryptanalysts know the actual message positions. The Enigma sequence was assumed to start with <coughs> rotor setting ZZZ. In other words, before the crib, just before the crib, it's assumed that the wheels were set to ZZZ. So the first Enigma key depression would move the wheels to ZZA. And up there, you can see that at ZZA, <coughs> W up there, W goes to S. And so on through the sequence to ZZP at the end, where E goes to V. <coughs> now this shows the menu device from the crib which went to the rain bomb operators. Although at the time it went to them, it would exclude the information at the bottom. The menu specifies wheels 253, the inter-scrambler and diagonal wall connections, the input test position at letter, crib letter, menu letter G, that's up there, and the input test letter A. Although the wrens were always instructed which input letter to use, it did not really matter which letter was used, as the bomb would always give the correct result if it found a good stop. <clears throat> Now, the drums were a key element of the bomb design. And this shows three drums by a scrambler, and on the left, the mounting plate. Now note the four concentric rings of connector pads. Enigma wheels, or rotors, had only one set of wires cross-connecting the letter positions. The bomb drums had two concentric pairs of letter positions and cross wires in order to separate the scrambler inputs from the outputs. That is why when we are working out uh, the menu the menu routes through the through the letters, we can go in either we can go forward that way or we can go backwards. It doesn't matter which way, because the, because the scramblers have been wired in such a way to separate the inputs from the outputs. Very clever. This shows the bomb drum a little bit closer with the wires that make contact with the mounting plate. This was standard BTM card reader technology of the day. I can assure you that in my early days, if there was trouble with the, with the card reader, it was either the feed slot or it was one of these things that was the trouble. Not the bomb drum, I meant the wires. So, as instructed <coughs> on the menu, wheels 253 were mounted on the drum for each menu position. 253, 253, 253, all the way along for the menu, which might be 13 characters long, possibly. And 
they were then offset. Now this is a slow wheel, and that's a fast wheel. So they were set to Z, Z, A, Z, Z, B, Z, Z, C, and so on. Mimicking the position, mimicking the keystroke positions. Because each time there was a keystroke, the wheel, the right hand wheel, would move one position, and so would the bottom. All the bombs, all of them would move all together. So. Now this final lady is Jean Valentine, who some of you may have met when you went up to Bletchley. She's a, she's a guy up in Bletchley, a fine guy. And she was a wren, trained at Bletchley Park. And then she moved to Eastcote where she was shown the bomb for the first time. And it soon became clear <clears throat> that she wasn't tall enough. Anyone that stood by the side of her, she's up to here. She's a tiny lady. So they made a big stick. They, made, they told her the big secret, so they were stuck with her. So they made her a wooden step so that she could reach the top. <laughs> she's struggling there, you see. But actually, in, in the bomb broke bay, we did have a step for her so she could get to the top. <coughs> the connect, the jack connectors. Twenty-six lines for each connector. So the leads were then connected to the jack panel according to the menu, starting with the test and input jack at the top right. The third, fourth, and fifth columns our scrambler input-output jacks could be input or output jacks from the scramblers, <coughs> the diagonal board jacks, and the multi-connector jacks. Because sometimes you need more than one jack to connect it together, so that you use these multi-connector jacks to connect them together. <coughs> Oops. In normal use, of course, the machine will be closed with covers in place. The rings would select input, in this case, input panel switch A, whoops, on the far left, over here, let's get the specs up there, and start the bomb run. Press the bot start button and start the bomb run. To the right of the switch panel is the indicator panel. That's that one there. But we can take a closer look at that. This is a closer look at the indicator panel with the covers in place. <clears throat> there are three sets of levers. One for each menu group or scramblers on the machine. Because it could have more than one set of scramblers. It could have, it could have perhaps two or three menus on the same machine. <clears throat> And the number, the letters, A to Z, whoops, A to Z, A to Z, A to Z, A to Z. And the bomb often gave a number of spurious or false stops. Or, however, as I said, a good stop will be indicated on a bank by one lever down, just one lever down, or all levers down except one. Now, while the bomb was running and the, and the wrens worked in pairs, one of the wrens would select menu wheels 253 and prepare the chicken machine. Now this was simply a single scrambler with a 26 letter input keyboard and a 26 letter output lamp panel. <clears throat> Each chicken machine had a set of five, five drums. They were slightly special, different to the drum bombs, in that whoops, in that this letter ring was rotatable. It was stable. You could you could push it round and move that round. And there was a marker on the drum which indicated the actual position 
on the jetting machine. So, when the bomb stopped, it would indicate the first stacker letter at menu input letter G. Remember? Input letter was given as A. Input A at point G, and it goes. The machine would then chew it away. And when it stopped, it would say, aha, uh -huh. in this particular case, the letter, the sticker letter for G is Q. The bomb would also give the stop indicator DKX. And this is just a little bit difficult. Sorry about this. DKX. This was the rotor setting before the first letter of the crib. So just before the, and the, you know, the position, the Aneva machine would have been set to DKX. <clears throat> but if it did this, it, would com it could be quite complicated for the ring operators. So the cryptanalysts devised a system. And to help the checking machine operator, it would also give another Aneva stop called VOB. So DKX, and it would also say VOB. But VOB was the reciprocal of DKX relative to ZZZ. So each wheel had this rotatable ring, and they were set to VOB. Each one was set to VOB. Sorry, not each one. They were set to VOB. That was ring to V O B. The three wheels then fitted to the checking machine and were rotated each one to Z Z E. Now in that position, sounds complicated, but what you actually done is it's the same as setting them originally to DKX to set them by offsetting the wheels, setting it to V O B and it's now equivalent to ZZD, then set it to ZZE. It provided a very simplified, repetitive procedure for the REN operators. Now this is a further illustration of the menu. Oops. Ah! This machine, I don't know if it's your machine, Chris, or it's my machine. But these letters here, that's, these are the stacker letters in there. There, there, and there. They're the stacker letters. And on my machine, <coughs> they're in Greek, because they're unknown, so I wrote them in Greek. But my machine, or this machine, each time it goes on, it changes the Greek. He said, ah, you're in English. So it changed them to English. Don't worry about that. So it's showing the menu letters. <coughs> That's there, showing there, there, the menu letters. It's also showing the stacker board. It's only illustrative, but it's showing the stacker board in red. And it's showing the stacker letters, which should have been in Greek, in and out of the scramblers, which are unknown before the bomb run. Now, the bomb, oops, can I go back? Yeah. <clears throat> but the bomb gave stuck a letter Q, this one here, Q, a G. Wow. So the checking machine operator now set is, 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 drums to ZZE. It presses Q and it writes like T, which is the stacker letter for E. He presses, he sets it to ZZF, presses key T and it writes like N, which is the stacker letter for V. And he works his way around, or she works his way around until she sets the the check-in machine to ZZ, is that F? L. 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 ZZL. And pressing key, whoops, and pressing key R gives Q again 
for, z, for G. And that is, that is a consistent result around that loop. What she now does, she goes on and sets it to, I'm going to walk here, ZZO, presses letter Q, key Q, which gives J for L. ZZI, presses key R, which gives P, the stacker letter for Z. And as she works her way around, she fills this table in, which are all the letters the crib letters or the menu letters, and she inserts the stacker letters. This is telling the telling the cryptologist how to plug the stacker board on the machine. <clears throat> so, providing there were no inconsistencies as in this case, the menu was returned to the cryptanalysts who were satisfied would you get a job up and the bomb would be stripped ready for the next job. Now the cryptanalysts still had to deduce the missing stacker letters and the Enigma rotor green settings. However, once they had done that and proven the decrypt, they were then able to decipher all the messages for that day for that traffic on that network. For example, they could be able to do decipher all the reds. Don't forget I said they're all color coded, the red traffic <coughs> for Luftwaffe operations, or the brown traffic, the Luftwaffe night beams. Find out where the night beams are going to be set. <coughs> <coughs> On the right of this slide is my colleague and project leader, John Harper, who took up the bomb rebuilt challenge in 1997 under the wing of the Computer Conservation Group, which is part of the British Computer Society. I joined the project team in 2000 and spent seven years, as I said, uh, making the electrical coils and non-inductive resistors, but helping to, with some commissioning uh, and debugging <coughs> and fielding visitors. The machine rebuild was finally completed in 2007 and the rebuild 10th anniversary was marked by the inaugural switch on by His Royal Highness, and that's in July 19, 20, 2007, by His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent, the BCS patron, with the BCS president of the day, Professor Nigel Shambolt. This also coincided with the BCS 50th anniversary which was also celebrated that day, or that weekend, at Blesher Park. Now these three fine ladies all worked at Blesher Park. In the middle is Jean Valentine, who I've already mentioned, the short one. <laughs> On the left is another regular guy at Blesher Park, this lady here, lovely lady. She's Ruth Bourne. And she worked the bombs at East Court and Stanmore. Now both are regular guys at Bletchley, and they're both honorary members of the bomb rebuild team. So they all are entitled to wear this. Ruth is very, very keen to spread the word about Bletchley Park. She's done given loads of talks throughout Buckinghamshire. She says that when she visits school, she said children often have a somewhat garbled idea. Because one little boy at a school, he was quite young, near Milton Keynes, and he said, oh, we know all about Colossus. Colossus? Oh yes, we know all about Colossus. Because he got, he got it wrong. <clears throat> the ladies there all were naked. <laughs> really? <laughs> Who told you that, Daddy? Who told you that? <laughs> Actually, the, the ladies, if there was no engineers around, the ladies were allowed to, the, the wrens were allowed to take off their outer garments. I would love to have seen that, actually. <laughs> now this, whoops, come on, I know you're going to do it. Now this is a rebuilt bomb in its current display location. Our plans are now well advanced 
for a relaunch of Bletchley Park in 2014. A lot of work and a lot of money being spent at the moment. Uh, when the bomb will finally return to Ot 11A, which was purposely built for it. So to recap, intercepts from the Y stations were sent to reception, then to registry. From the preamble, each intercept was classified and colour coded according to network, command and traffic and copied to the appropriate cryptanalyst team. <coughs> they were deduced the likely rotor choice and order and probable crypts. They would devise a menu and pass this to the bomb brain operators who would operate in pairs. And one would set up the bomb according to the menu and they'd run the machine. The maximum run time was about 15 minutes with no stops. That's without a stop. But stops or you know, a stop or several stops would usually occur. Details from a stop will be taken by the second operator and te tested on the checker machine, while the bomb continued looking for further stops. And as soon as the checker machine confirmed a good stop, the results were passed back to the cryptologists, who, if satisfied, would declare job up. And the bomb was stripped and set up for the next menu. The cryptanalyst would then deduce the remaining stacker letter pairs, as I explained to you, the rotor ring settings, and decipher the coded message <coughs> on a Type X machine wired to emulate the Enigma. And when successful, all intercepts for that network, for that traffic, on that day, could be deciphered. Final deciphered messages were registered and copied to the liaison team, who prepared ultra messages for Churchill the Chiefs of Staff and the appropriate Allied Commanders. It's said that the Allied Commanders would sometimes read Ultra before the German Commanders read the Enigma operator uh, Optifrips. It's not surprising actually because remember the keys and everything were changed each day at midnight and <clears throat> Bletchley was already you know beginning to get information from the white stations and one of the first things would be, I mean, we've even, we even had, uh, there's been cases where an Enigma operator would sign on because it was his turn, and would, you know, it would, it would uh, type out what it was, and then the, uh, the telegraphs would send it, and it would be sending out uh, blah, 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 uh, nothing to report. Now, it's a crib, it's a faint, fantastic for cribs. Or it would send out a weather forecast, and weather forecasts were, really superb way of breaking into Enigma. And they were coming through in the middle of the night. So as I say, quite often the English command, the, Brit the Allied commanders would often read the letters, read the ultra before the German commander got up and had his breakfast and read the, read the report, read the thing. Amazing. <clears throat> it's been said many times that Bletchley and Ultra shortened the war by two years, many, many times. But it's also been put another way, that without the help of the bombs, it would have been difficult, if not impossible, in 1941-42, to break the German naval enigma code. And we could have lost the Battle of the Atlantic and been starved into submission. some video clips that were taken at Bletchley Park and let's see oh it's a blank screen at the moment do I press anything to get the screen up oh the button oh touch the screen to start excellent <clears throat> so we're now going to put it onto that and it comes up Sound. It's a bit quiet. 
better stop it and go back. had believed unbreakable. The star started moving. Enigma gave some insight into how they did it. March and April, their man of log sheets. And the intercept of March 28th, April 3rd, April 9th, 15th, 16th, 17th. And orchestral settings. Last one first. Might tell us why Claire disappeared. Now exactly where the German Enigma codes cracked, but it was achieved using huge machines called British Turing bombs. And for the first time since the end of the world of the war, we can see one in action. Yes, back to Sarah Campbell. It's back at Bletchley Park for us this morning. So, what does it look like, Sarah? How does it work? Well, it looks pretty amazing. You've just seen one of those Enigma machines. This is one of the original ones. It just looks like a little typewriter. This is how the German military communicated. They, as you say, thought their codes were unbreakable. So they sent messages to each other that they knew people could hear, but they didn't mind because they were unbreakable. Not surprising because there were 150 million, million, million combinations. So they weren't pretty worried about, uh, about whether they could be broken. Jean Valentine, you're one of the people that were instrumental in breaking those codes with the help of this. This is a Turing bomb machine. How does it work? How did you work it? Well, the machine was set up with information given to us by Hut 6, people who had already started to break into the code and got a foot in the door. We'd plug up the back, we'd set up the front. That is a drum. Let's have a look at that. So these are inside all these little dials. It's so complicated. There's four little brushes behind every letter of the alphabet, and each of them has 19 filaments. And, and you used to keep these in repair using your tweezers, is that right? Yes, because one little filament touching something else, you've got a short. What we're not looking for is shorts, we're looking for open circuits. Was it fun working here during the Second World War? Yes, it was. It it, was. Were you aware of what important work you were doing? I knew what I was doing, but I didn't know what anybody else was doing in any other hut. Amazing. Well, let's switch on the machine, and I'm going to uh, take a look around the back, because these the machines really are absolutely incredible. Uh, they've taken 10 years to be rebuilt, this particular one. They were all destroyed after the Second World War, because, of course, this was a huge state secret. John Harper, one of the team that rebuilt them, um, very complicated around the back. It took 10 years. That's right. 10 years. How did you do it? Why did you do it? Well, why? It's um, more about an interest that I had with my previous employers, where I met a lot of them, uh, very interesting people who had worked on these. And they got me going. Um, such a fascinating story, such a history. Do you think, uh, I mean, how important was this the machine to the, the, to the war, to the, to the end of the war? Well, you have to take it as part of the whole package that Bletchley Park itself created, where the uh, ultra information really did change the uh, direction of World War II. And without this machine, they wouldn't have been able to take the Enigma information turn it into Ultra and feed that all through to our commanders and, and give them the edge over the uh, enemies. Okay, John, well, it is absolutely fascinating. The, uh, the Turing bomb will have was spat out a code on the other side. I mean, it really is fascinating. If you'd like to find out any more details and come and see the machine for yourself, all the details are on the BBC Breakfast website. Back to you. Sarah, what a wonderful machine. It almost looks like it's run by steam or something, like <laughs> clanking and Good to go see that, actually. Now then, it's uh, 8.22. Now, we're pounding these top-secret Enigma coders, showing us how they did it. The code was supposed to be unbreakable, with billions of combinations, but the code breakers at Fletcher Park in Buckinghamshire built extraordinary machines to decipher it. Today, one of them is back up and running there, and Robert Hall is at Fletcher Park. Robert. Sophie, appearances can be deceptive. This is the Enigma machine, captured by the Allies during the Second World War and enabling the Allies to break the Germans' most secret codes. If I get our friend here to demonstrate, it effectively looks like a typewriter, but the wheels, the cog wheels at the back, are jumbling the letters. What are the combinations? Well, the estimate is 158 million, million, million combinations of different ways of decoding that message. Now, at Bletchley Park, where 10,000 code breakers worked, there was a crucial need, having captured the Enigma machine, of working out how to crack the code. And they designed a machine which was called the BOMB, B-O-M-B-E. And in fact, by the end of the war, in the huts at Bletchley Park, they had about 200 of these machines. Here is the rebuilt bomb. Hopefully, by pushing this button, we can get it to work. 
Now what's happening is that these cogs, which are loaded independently, depending on what they thought the code might be for the day, are working out possible permutations of the code. And the operators would then take those permutations to the British Enigma machine and try and work out the message. Well, John, you led the team to rebuild this. Let me see if I can turn it off so we keep the sound down. <laughs> How big a job? Well, first of all, I'm sure it's impossible to explain, but broadly, what is this machine doing? It's doing almost what you said. It's finding the position in which the uh, <clears throat> settings for the day for that particular Enigma message could be um, brought through and put onto the, our own machine. It's number crunching, really, isn't it? Yeah. Trial and error, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and how big a job to repair it? Ten years to get it running again. Massive. Yeah. Very, very hard for you all? Well, it's been a tremendous team effort. There's been up to 60 people involved at one time uh, over that 10 year period. So uh, I've lost count of how many man hours. Let me, let me bring Ruth Bourne in, because Ruth, you actually operated these machines. Right. You had no idea, did you, what the coded messages said? No idea. We just knew if the job had been brought up, as they say, they would uh, say job up. And then you knew that uh, you had found the setting, or rather not you, but the machine. Did you get any sense from all the secrecy here of just how important a job you were all doing? Well, we knew it was very important because of the secrecy. We were not allowed to talk about anything we did in the actual Bombay after we had left it. Nobody spoke a word, so it was very secret. Ruth, John, thank you very much indeed. Just a final word from me. Winston Churchill called the Bletchley Codebreakers the geese that laid the golden eggs. Perhaps without these machines, <coughs> they wouldn't have managed it. Back to you, Sophie. Robert, thank you very much. And just a quick reminder. I think we better stop it there. We've got some time. <coughs> Are there any questions? Gentlemen. One of the failings of the Enigma machine was that it could not code the letter to itself. So I think it's, sorry. One of the failings of the Enigma machine was it could not code any letter back to itself. No, it can't. Uh, no, it couldn't. How? Uh, because when <coughs> when the the, uh, the question was uh, sorry, the Enigma machine was unable to encode a letter to itself. So uh, the question actually was how. So there's two there's two reasons. First of all, there's only one. Each wheel only had one set of wires, A to Z, junction to in, in only one set of wires. So you'd go in on one uh, on one set of wires through the first wheel, the second wheel, third wheel, the reflector, then you'd come back through the same wires, but obviously on a different route. That's the first thing. Second thing is that when you pressed a key, say key <coughs> A, it disconnected the lamp panel, the lamp, the panel lamp A, it disconnected it, and it put it through the machine, and it would come back, and it couldn't come back on the same thing because the reflector would change it around the other side. Are you with me? It goes from wheel one to wheel two to wheel three to the reflector. The reflector will, will change it on the other side and then come back through a set of set of wires and light a different lamp. So it will never light lamp the same lamp as the keys the the the, 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 the depressed key. Does that answer it? No. Oh, that's a <laughs> It's, it's actually quite, it is really quite simple. <laughs> you, you press key, key A, forget the fact that it's disconnected the lamp, the lamp panel A, forget that for a minute. You press key A, key A goes in, and as soon as it hits the three wheels, it will go through the wires, and then it will change through the reflector. Now, to come back and light lamp A, it would have to come back on the same wires, but the reflector puts it into a different set of wires, and it comes back through on a different set of wires, and lights on a different lamp. So it can't, it cannot code itself to the same letter. It's impossible. <laughs> but, but from a cryptanalyst's point of view, that was an, that was a, an important thing. Because they knew that any letter, whatever letters were, uh, were in the co in the coded letter thing, it could not code to itself. It was always be to a different letter. Right. Perhaps I know too much. Actually, it seems it seems so simple to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, any, any more question? Yes. 
I read to him on account that there was considerable involvement from the GPO, Tommy Powers. Yes, but that was on a different machine. Colossus. That was on the Colossus. So that was the more electronic than electronic. It was electronic, yes, Bounce. with valves. It was a, it's a fantastic machine. And you can see the, the Colossus uh, at Bletcher Park as well. And again, on weekends, they occasionally, not always, not everyone always, but they do occasionally run the machine as well to show you how it works. But they really, you're looking at it, it's much easier to see and understand the Enigma. Yeah, yeah, that's what the Enigma does. And then you see, then you go over to the bottom and you can see the wire, you know, how the cables are being put, and you can see it going around, you get a better appreciation. But you go to the Colossus and all you can see is a bunch of electronics. And you don't know what it's doing. <laughs> But actually, there was um, there was there was a BBC program. I, I mean, really, some of you may have seen it. There was a BBC program not very long ago um, on the Colossus, and this guy that I speak, spoke to, he does talks up actually called uh, Frank Carter, and he explained. It was quite simple actually. He explained how the Lorenz system works um, because it's it's based on the teleprinter code. Teleprinter. But they, 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 they would add, add another code to it and change it. But if you know what that code, what, what, that, what those, what those uh, seven digits were, is it five digits? Seven what? digits. Five digits, was it? Was it five? I thought it was seven. Actually, it's a five digit. Because uh, ten printed, don't forget. Um, the, um, I think it's seven. But anyway, the, if, you, if, you, if you add that and then transmit it, if you know what that code is, when you get the stuff back, you can actually add that code back in, and that code will cancel out the correct, you know, cancel out the decode, the code, and give you the original, the original uh, message. It's very, very, very clever. Any more? That's it. I think, uh, in the interest of the time, uh, we'll say we'll leave it there. But I would encourage anyone with any further questions to, to jump out and. I should be outside for a little while, you know.